Yes, so I was going to cover this uh, very, at least I believe, very interesting project that has been around for about three years, too, with OWASP. But um, we're going to start with a little background, since I, I don't know how many people are familiar with this project. All right, and myself. So yeah, today I was going to cover an introduction to a mass since, as I said, I don't know how many people listening are familiar with it. I'm going to give a brief demonstration and hopefully some um, recommendations on how to use it if you'd like to give it a shot. And just some interesting things that we've noticed while uh, running this project, uh, primarily from people that we've used it with and where we plan on taking it, and of course, questions. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to just throw it into the comments. Uh, I think we're gonna do our best to answer them throughout the talk. If, uh, if that's not possible, then we'll try to address them at the end. So who am I? Jeff Foley, uh, I am a security researcher. So that, that's where my career began. I'm honored to be an OWASP leader now. Uh, for this project. But throughout my career, I've been a technical leader, uh, very focused on offensive security, red teaming, and uh, a little bit on the blue side as well with vulnerability management. I am also honored to be a adjunct professor for SUNY Polytechnic Institute, where I teach penetration testing. All right, moving on. So what it, what is this, the MASS project? So Put simply, it's attack surface mapping and asset discovery. Uh, it's, it's a tool. So feel free to please go to uh, this GitHub repo where most of the information about this project can be found. And of course, many ways to uh, get your hands on it and begin using it. So this was originally developed uh, honestly, to help me understand clients. I mean, that it was to understand their attack surface and then discuss gaps with them in meetings. And I just didn't really feel like doing this manually all the time. Uh, there's a nice little story as to how exactly did it become open source. Uh, but let's just say I shared it with some people and they seemed to like it. And so we, we decided to continue supporting the community by making this uh, better. I mean, not just me, of course, but users, contributors, everyone that's been involved with it so far. So I like to say here that, um, you know, I was impressed that OWASP understood how important this is, especially since I think it falls a little outside of the, the normal or typical OWASP project. Uh, just that this isn't strictly, say, software security. It's a little bit more on the side of understanding infrastructure or understanding exposure on the internet, uh, more from a host level perspective. It doesn't really go into your software's asset, or sorry, um, attack surface. So it's a little different, but I think the general attitude was, well, if you don't know these things are exposed on the internet, then how can you begin securing them? And OWASP uh, told me that they wanted to add this to their uh, to their portfolio, which was announced July of 2018. And uh, yeah, it started like any other project, uh, just as one of these like little incubator kind of projects or but uh, it, it grew, it seemed to grow pretty quickly. And uh, again, I'm, I'm honored that it's a considered a flagship project today. All right. So I was gonna go qui um, quickly through a little bit of, well, why is this important? Or, you know, why should people be thinking more about this before we just dive right into this tool? So if you go look at some just studies that have been done recently, and I, and I would tell you that from my own experience, 
this is all quite accurate, if not generous in, in the uh, numbers that came out of this uh, study or survey. But companies, especially larger companies that do have what, you know, what they claim are mature secure, security programs, often have very inaccurate uh, asset inventory or configuration management databases. I find this very interesting given that I would consider this an essential function for security. Uh, there's other ways to track this information, such as listed here, uh, you can use host-based uh, agents, but the study shows that even when that's done, the numbers really don't change that much. The problem is just quite real. And until what these last two bullets are trying to say here is until a security program starts going beyond what these CMDB uh, systems contribute to your understanding of your assets, until they start using tools that are really reaching out and trying to say, what do we have out there? They just don't get a very accurate view. That's pretty important though, I think, because for instance, um, from my own experience with vulnerability management, it's kind of hard to make sure that you're checking everything for vulnerabilities if you don't know what you should be checking. So if your inventory or your discovery methods are not good enough, then you're just not gonna be checking all the exposed assets that you should be. Pretty serious problem in my opinion. So assuming uh, we're, we all agree, well then we need these uh, tools that help us discover exposed assets. Yeah, so I guess I guess I got ahead of myself, but th these first couple of bullets say, I mean, these these are very important. I've I've seen some other teams as well, not just uh, vulnerability management, <clears throat> like threat hunting, where when they did not have this information, either very up to date or just reliable, if they couldn't rely on the information to be accurate, it had a huge impact on their uh, effectiveness productivity because they spent so much time constantly answering the question of what is this and where is this and who does it belong to instead of tracking the problem or keeping on top of the problem which is what they were there to do uh, and in in general it goes back to this i would say more easy to understand uh statement here which is if you just if you don't know it's there, you're not going to be able to protect it. It's it's just that simple, and which is in, an, it's interesting that blue teams are dealing with this, or def, people on the defense are dealing with this. Since if you look at this more from a the perspective of a battle or a war, this is the advantage defenders should have. <laughs> they're they're the ones that should know what the battle space looks like. This is, this is what the uh, attacker should be having trouble with, not the defender. Attackers should be the ones that have to scout for what the battle space looks like and have trouble understanding what to do next. All right, so moving on with that. One more uh, important thing about this is lots of times when I interface with these teams and I, you know, I ask simple questions like, well, do you have a network diagram, you know, something we can look at to understand your environment? You know, you often get the <laughs> people embarrassed to answer the question that they don't have it or they, they don't have it up to date or that it's just stuck in some, someone's head and they're not in the room right now or something like that. So, even if they even if they could produce that, it means it's a snapshot that they took at some other date, right? It could have, could have been months ago. And this is the best they have for 
what their own environment looks like. But attackers don't operate that way. Attackers are always reevaluating targets. They look at targets as they actually are at the time. So you have, um, again, this strange situation where the defenders know less about their own environment than the attackers do. And they're just not even looking at it the same way, I guess you could say. This is why <clears throat> as we as we shift to using these tools that can keep us informed about exposure, it needs to be a continuous process. Uh, you know, executed, you could say, as an attacker would, where it's constantly being reevaluated, it's being watched for changes, so that good questions can be asked, like, was that supposed to be put there? Or why did we take that down? Or I mean, you can't really tell if a change is taking place if you're not continuously monitoring for the changes. <clears throat> These all seem like easy to understand <laughs> concepts. It's interesting how many organizations do not operate this way though. So I have a couple little factoids in here just about, you know, when you do put these in, uh, processes in place, it's incredible though how much faster you can respond to threats or for instance, an, an exposure that wasn't supposed to take place because you would pretty much immediately find out about it and um, be able to fix it. All right, so coming back to a mass. So a mass is one of these tools, these network tools that are helping to solve this problem. But what exactly does it do? So it performs enumerations. That's what this, this is. Enumerations designed to start with something as simple as like a second level domain name and tell you as you know every asset it could find that should be considered in scope or belonging to you that's exposed on the internet and it performs this by collecting data uh, that can be acquired using like open source intelligence and network reconnaissance such as fully qualified domain names or DNS names, IP addresses, um, IP address ranges like CIDRs, and ASNs. So these are all, of course, uh, network or internet infrastructure um, pieces of information. And very important, though, to understanding where an organization is on the internet. So as I already mentioned on the last slide, the tool also saves all this in this graph database so it can track the changes from one enumeration to the next, which uh, is quite powerful. I mean, put as a simple example, you could, you could set that up so that maybe all it does is from one enumeration to the next, if something new is found, you are notified about it. That, that alone could be pretty powerful. By, ch uh, by saving the information, another thing that we can do that is very helpful, especially if you're a very visual person, is we can visualize the data. And I'll show you what, a little bit about what that looks like uh, later on. So just real quick, <clears throat> continuing the idea of, well, so how does this work or what does this mean exactly? So most organizations have multiple domain names they've registered. That being an understatement, I mean, many organizations have could have thousands of uh, domain names. And they usually use those domain names to create name spaces where they have subdomain names uh, within the second level domain. So in this uh, diagram that I grabbed from uh, the source below, because I just think it kind of makes it easy to understand. 
the vertical domain correlation is where we are trying to get subdomain names or names that have been used within a second level domain. The horizontal domain correlation is where you're making the association that in this diagram that google.com and youtube.com both belong to Google. So when you're trying to understand your organization, your target organization's presence or exposure on the internet, you need to understand all these uh, namespaces and to what degree they're being used. And uh, all this kind of falls into this activity just called domain name correlation. All right. And we use uh, open source intelligence to help us with this quite a bit. So the OWASPA mass project supports over 50 different data sources. Some of these are, uh, you can use right out of the box. Some of them you have to register to be able to use them. But it's quite a, quite a lot of information at your disposal <clears throat> so that you can just have a mass do all the work for you of digging up uh, the exposure that an organization has on the internet by, you know, between all the registrations that they've done for names and IP, you know, IP address ranges. And uh, just for instance, like passive DNS records where it shows activity within these namespaces. And if, the 50 plus data sources that we offer are not enough. That's uh, not a problem either because similar, you could say similar to Nmap, uh, a mass offers the ability to write your own scripts that are written in Lua, again, similar to Nmap, to expand your data sources. So you could, if you knew about other ones that you wanted to be able to use, as a simple example, maybe one of them being your own asset inventory then you could easily roll that into your use of a mess. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, so we also uh, give the user the option of using more active methods, such as uh, for instance, a pretty powerful one is the ability to take these IP addresses that we find and then uh, have a mass reach out to them and attempt to grab uh, TLS certificates. The, these active methods, though, are not turned on by default because I guess at the moment, uh, for now, the policy that this tool has is that unless you give it permission, it's going to behave in such a way that hopefully it won't reveal your position or your activities. <clears throat> so you should be able to use this and not draw too much attention to yourself or have the target organization become aware of your, your activities. But if that's not a, you know, not a problem or if this is your own organization that you're using it against, then I would say definitely uh, use the active methods. Say contribute to the findings or they enhance the findings. All right, this is a pretty big one. Since uh, that name correlation is a pretty big deal, uh, DNS brute forcing is a pretty important part of what we do in a, in a handful of different ways. Uh, I would say the big ones being uh, just your good old dictionary attacks using a word list like most tools allow you to do. But we also do some other things that are pretty powerful like uh, we call them name alterations but you could think of them as uh, DNS name mutations, but where we take a name that was successfully resolved and then we, we start playing with it and making new names that are slightly different. So these similar names are then attempted and it's pretty, a pretty effective method. Uh, and then of course we do reverse DNS sweeping. So that's where, you know, we, we have a, name that resolved to an IP address. And now we say, well, what are the chances that maybe around that IP address, there's other names 
or other assets belonging to the same organization. So we sweep around that IP address asking, are there DNS names associated with these IP addresses? <clears throat> That's also a fairly effective method. Uh, it depends on the organization and how often they're giving reverse DNS records to their assets. And we've played around with some other arguably uh, more interesting methods like uh, you know, using n-gram frequencies and Markov chains to try to identify similar names or names that have a high likelihood of being used given that or based on the names we've already seen used. So that, that was pretty in interesting. There's a lot of work to be done in that if we're going to, if it's going to be worth it, I guess I would say. <clears throat> So part of what makes this tool different than uh, a lot of other options that exist out there is, I mean, unless someone can show me that I'm in, uh, wrong in what I'm about to say, it's the only tool that I found so far where it has this cyclic design or this engine where it's event driven. So what that means is all these techniques, all these data sources, when they find, um, so they, 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 you could say they generate potential names and IP addresses and things that look likely to belong to the target organization. And when it's confirmed that they do belong to the organization, or at least to the best of our ability to determine that, that information is then shared with all the other data sources to give them the opportunity to say, oh, wow, th this was discovered. Well, then what else can we find based on that? Of course, keeping all the results in scope, um, at least for now. <laughs> um, we're, right now, we're pretty strict about scope, but I'm thinking of creating options to loosen that a little bit for people that just want to see what could be out there. But yeah, it's, it's a pretty powerful technique because it, I guess you could say what it means is instead of just asking a data source, have you heard of this before? And then see what it gives you back and then say, okay, that's it. This allows you to keep the process going until I guess you could say literally there's just nothing left to look into. And it definitely fi finds or creates more findings. An interesting example that showed up really quick when we were developing this is this alt and sweep technique where you have a name that was resolved and that name is then shared with the name alterations brute forcing method and it creates uh, new potential names. If any of those names are successful and the IP address that they resolve to is in a, say, different subnet than the original name that uh, we started with, then when we do reverse DNS sweeping around the new IP address, uh, there's this potential that we're going to find a, a lot of new uh, names. And all those names now are confirmed names, and they now go back to the name alteration um, data source, as we refer to it as, and the process continues. So, <clears throat> I mean, it's it's funny how, depending on your target, that alt and sweep method can go on for quite a long time, actually, assuming, of course, they have a lot of um, reverse DNS records set up, and they're using similar names in their name naming scheme. But it happens. It's a, it's a typical uh, situation. So yeah, there's there's a lot of data sources that are built into a mass where they heavily contribute to this cyclic or recursive process. But it's a big reason why this tool generates more findings than alternative tools. It al it also contributes to why it takes longer. So if you try this out, you'll see what I mean. It it takes longer to run this because it's just working more to find more. 
All right. Getting closer to what I imagine most viewers are look, looking to see, which is, so how do they get their hands on this? So if you want to um, follow along or you just plan on trying this out later, I would say either fire up Kali Linux and it's probably in there already. If not, you should definitely be able to install it just by saying install a mass. Um, Snap can make it possible for you to install it. Although I would just warn you, Snap has um, an isolation method it uses for all the things that are installed. And there are some limitations it imposes on a mass that can quickly become frustrating. <clears throat> so it's probably not the best option depend if you're going to use um, a lot of Amass's features. Uh, Homebrew has a, you know, you can install it using Homebrew. You can get a Docker image for this. You can go to the repo and, you know, we have pre-built binaries. Or if you're just comfortable with Go, I would say, then uh, follow the instructions on the repo and just go build it. It's probably your, one of your best choices. All right. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to, skip this slide because what potentially can show up here is um, the tool being used. But what I was going to do is show it to you myself. <clears throat> so in the interest of time, though, what I've done is I don't want to actually run a full enumeration. It takes too long. <laughs> We'd be sitting here just talking while we're waiting for this to finish. But what I would like to do is show you what it looks like when you use this and what some of the things are to think about when you execute your enumeration. And I will show you what the data looks like and things like that because I did some of these prior to the um, presentation. So we'll take a look. But for instance, if you were, if you download this and you've got it on your machine and, you know, now you're saying, all right, what, what, what do I do with it? You would, of course, find out where the binary is. Or if it's in your path, then, then you're, you're all set. But for me, it's, it's right here. Now, if you just kick this off, what you should see is this extremely basic uh, help screen. So because it has no idea what you're trying to do right now. But if you pick one of these subcommands that are right here and then ask for help, for instance, like the enum uh, subcommand, now you're going to get some more interesting information on usage. And as you can see here, there are a handful of options, right? So that's why I want to talk about this a little bit. So how do you know what to use, how do you know how to control some of the behaviors of, of a mass? All right, so here's how I like to use it. Personally, I like to see where the data is coming from. So this source flag will show you, along with the names and the IP addresses, the source that originally found it. And I kind of like to know what it is. Uh, I also like to see the IP address. You have to tell it to, to reveal it. And I normally use brute forcing. So you have to turn that on because it's not, I turn it off by default because it, it's definitely a expensive thing to run. <clears throat> but here's something to think about that isn't completely obvious uh, maybe not even from the documentation given that it's a little new, but if, if we were to move forward with this, so the D is domain and it's also your scope. So it d determines if it's not within this domain, then it's not going to be considered uh, an asset that belongs to this organization. <clears throat> but if we just fire that off, which will work, a mass is going to go find a uh, find a lot of public DNS resolvers to use for this enumeration. 
and it's it's only going to use each one a little bit. So the, the purpose for that being, hopefully, that way you don't exceed uh, thresholds or anything like that for you know what they consider reasonable usage. The only problem with that is it also means that there's a chance you're going to get resolvers that are not trustworthy or or they're not going to answer your requests because they might be out there but maybe they're not you know working properly anymore and you're probably going to end up with a higher rate of um like resends that have to be done on your request <clears throat> and if you if you're not if your enumeration is not extremely intensive what i would recommend you consider doing is defining your own resolver I don't usually uh, recommend that people use the same resolver that their system that they're running this from is using in the case that you did violate uh, what's considered reasonable usage because now your system won't be able, be able to resolve uh, DNS. I usually say use something public that way um, it won't matter too much if you can't use it anymore. But for instance, like a, a very high high performance public resolver that we all probably know is uh, this one. And, but you still have one more job to do, which is if you only define that, it's still gonna only use it to that very, um, at that very slow level I mentioned. But for instance, Google's resolver is quite capable of handling far more uh, traffic and it won't be too upset with you. So what I would say is define your max DNS queries and set it to something like 500 per second. So now you have a very res uh, reliable resolver at a reasonable rate. It's not exactly extremely fast, but it will keep things moving. And then you could define your target organization or domain. And by the way, for instance, this uh, can have a, uh, can be comma separated. So can uh, like the list of resolvers. There's a, there's a lot of things in here. If you look at the usage information where it says they're comma separated, so you can have a, a lot of values. <clears throat> or some of them um, support, for instance, using like files instead. So you could have something like like that, which a lot of people use this. So I, what I'm not, not going to do is actually run this right now, because otherwise we'll just be sitting here staring at it and it'll look kind of neat maybe, but it's going to be a waste of our time. So instead, what I'd like to do is we're all just going to assume that I did kick that off and now we're going to take a look at the information. So as mentioned earlier, uh, OWASP mass both at runtime and uh, when it's finished, is saving the information in a uh, graph database. And what I mean by at runtime and when it's finished is at runtime, it's saving this all in memory and it's doing this very quickly. <clears throat> but all that data is then stored into a, a permanent location when it's, comp when it's finished. So for instance, by default, it uses a, a, a file that stores the database. And we can pull the information back up by just saying, show us everything that we know about that domain. So what, what we have here is the names that were discovered and this summary information at the end where it, it says, you know, here's how many names were discovered, here are the methods that were used to discover how many names and this breakout of the ASNs that the names fell within. So as you can see, the majority of OWASP, or yeah, OWASP's uh, namespace are behind Cloudflare, but a few are found in you know, AWS. 
if you want to see just the names, for instance, but with source information and IP information, you can do that here as well. So it's, since we have a lot of IP addresses, <clears throat> it's a little, little bit crazy, but so what you have here is you have the source, you have the name, you know, the DNS name and all the IP addresses that were associated with it. So this, this can be interesting for, you know, many reasons, obviously, because you could say all of these could potentially be further investigated manually if you felt there was more to be found. Um, but also a very important uh, thing to know about is, so if we go to the help, the usage information for this subcommand, all this can be pulled out using the JSON uh, uh, flag here. So you can simply give it the JSON file you want it to go uh, output this to and the target domain or domains. And all this information will just get dumped into JSON, which makes it real easy, obviously, uh, to extract it for your, your needs. I find that pretty useful, but it does have to be done. If you want the complete information, it has to be done using the DB subcommand. So not there, there's also JSON uh, that can be output as it's being discovered from the enumeration, but it, there's the possibility that due to the cyclic nature of the engine, data can be discovered later uh, and put into the database that was not found at the time the asset was discovered. <clears throat> so just something to keep in mind. The, these are the things I wanted to cover to increase your, well, so, so that you could get maximum value out of this. So I think this would be a good time though to switch back to the content. There, there's a lot of things that you can do to play around with this. I would uh, encourage you to find some of the other videos that are already out there where I've done training sessions on this. And we really dig into everything from how to do effective brute forcing with it, how to write your own scripts for new data sources, things like that. All right, moving along. Okay, so I wasn't gonna do this on the command line. Um, I figured it would just look a little nicer here. <clears throat> but if you have multiple enumerations of the same target, like OWASP.org, and then you use uh, the tracking subcommand or track, it will tell you between what periods of time these enumerations took place and what was different. <clears throat> so it will say, well, it found these new names or new assets. It, these moved to different IP addresses. Um, and maybe some were removed. Although I, I would urge you to consider it possible that it just didn't find them as opposed to they were actually removed. I would definitely um, verify that yourself. But all the same, this is extremely useful because let's say your target is something much larger than OWASP where <clears throat> we're talking you know, hundreds of assets or maybe more. This really helps prune down uh, what you want to focus on, right? As opposed to just looking through all this data. What if you could just say, well, just tell me what has, uh, what changed from one to the next or the, from the last time I looked at this. And uh, yeah, going back to this uh, idea of, <clears throat> so what about when you just want to look at it and try to understand what, what this all means? So right from, almost the beginning, I mean, really early when this tool was uh, re released, this feature was available because 
I'm a very uh, visual person. But what you're seeing here is where we've taken the graph database and we've leveraged the infrastructure relationships that have been saved in the database to recreate uh, kind of like a, a layout <clears throat> for the assets. So everything from the actual domain names to these uh, green ones are the subdomain names, which for instance, like say they have a C name or alias uh, could end up pointing to a different organization and or a different uh, domain name. We have uh, orange, which is the IP addresses for these names and the CIDR ranges that they fall into, that's the pink ones, and the ASNs that those ranges are associated with. And there's some other uh, interesting ones, like these are mail servers, these purple ones, the light blue ones are name servers, uh, the yellow ones are pointer records, or as I mentioned earlier, the reverse DNS uh, records, so that we could go from an IP address and then uh, get this name here. What what you'll probably find if you use this feature is some of the structure that shows up in, in these graphs, it repeats itself. You'll find it again and again from one organization to the next. Like, you know, this is probably your classic uh, Gmail uh, architecture where, you know, this organization's using Google Mail for its uh, email. You know, there's other similar ones that, for instance, Microsoft, uh, their services are very easy on the yeah, on the eye. Like it's trivial to pick it out from the graph. But what I like about that is it, it kind of makes it easy to decide what portions of the graph you probably don't need to be looking at and then, and focus in on what's different about this organization from others and really get an idea of what should we be concerned about or questioning or making sure these things are supposed to be here. I would encourage you to play around with this. It's um, it's a pretty powerful feature. You can also look at it differently. Like let's say this is just uh, not doing it for you or it's uh, hurting your eyes. For instance, Maltigo, which is a very powerful tool for visualizing uh, infrastructure and personnel information. Uh, you can output your data that's discovered by a mass into a format that then can be imported by Maltigo and it will you know, generate rather complete uh, graphs or diagrams of the assets <clears throat> and all their dependencies and things like that. So this can be very useful as well, especially if you're gonna use this for like collaboration with other people. All right, so I'll try to get through these. I just wanted to share some interesting things that we've found during the life of this project. For instance, <clears throat> you know, maybe it's just me, but I still find it <laughs> kind of amazing how every single organization we've encountered where they've allowed us, you know, to uh, use this tool against their um, namespace, when we've shared the results with them, they've all been shocked by what they found. Like they all found, some, they all saw something in there that they said, wow, that wasn't supposed to be in there or we weren't aware that this was exposed. And it didn't matter how large this organization was, how impressive their security program was. I don't want to throw out names, but let's just trust me when I say some companies that if I did tell you the name, you would probably say they would have things under control. Uh, they still had these issues. <clears throat> no one seems to have this completely under control. And I find that very interesting. Um, so I, again, I would really encourage everyone to try to use it because no one seems to um, not need this right now. Uh, I, I've also found it kind of interesting when I was able to learn more about these organizations that many of them are not able to monitor their DNS traffic, like the, uh, specifically the, the traffic coming in, like the requests coming in. I consider this valuable information to understand interest in your organization or, or even suspicious activity that you know could seem outside the ordinary or what you want to see 
uh, for proper use of your services. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, when, when I looked, like I said, when I looked into these organizations, many of them even had this completely outsourced so that even if they wanted to start using the data, they couldn't because it wasn't really under their control anymore. I don't know. I find that uh, a bit shocking. <clears throat> it seems so valuable and like quite a cost to to give it up. Um, I also found that many blue teams I've spoken with, they don't seem to. Uh, so when they're considering how to protect things, <clears throat> many, many teams have told me that they just started or e <laughs> either they never have or some impressive teams have just have told me they just started to think about how an attacker is approaching a target or what an attacker needs to do in order to successfully um, compromise a target when they're considering their own defensive measures. So again, maybe, maybe it's just me, but wow, you know, that, that would be my initial approach would be, well, if we're going to prioritize, you know, resources, we're going to try to stay within budget. Let's consider in our situation, how an attacker would attack us and what does the attacker rely on in order to do this properly or, or with a high level of success. And let's start there and start reducing what the attacker has to work with. Let's minimize their options. Let's reduce their visibility. Let's force them to, uh, you know, let's increase the likelihood that they're going to come to where we want them to come, not where, you know, we want them to stay away from. You know, sometimes this is easier said than done, obviously, but if you have any control over this, that is what you should be doing so that you're minimizing the attacker's options. <clears throat> but instead, so many of these organizations, they have their attack surfaces wide open. So it's, it's like a playground to an attacker. It, it's trivial to see uh, what this organization looks like, uh, where would be a very safe place to try to come uh, to get in and then, you know, pivot to more interesting places. There's just so much uh, a blue team can do to, re to minimize this. So I just find it very interesting that this isn't the norm. It's, currently the advanced considered the advanced method <clears throat> but i would uh, i would encourage anyone to maybe use this co this concept or uh, approach when they're considering their next uh, how they're going to protect themselves And this is probably one of my favorite slides. This is where, you know, I want to share with some people what we have in mind for, so where are we going to take this? So the, the largest or the most exciting thing in my mind right now uh, on this list is JARM. And if you've never heard of this, I would say, please uh, go read that blog post from Salesforce Engineering. This is an incredible contribution that they've just recently made this month. Uh, to perform TLS server fingerprinting. Uh, why is that important? Well, <clears throat> for the MS projects, so far, DNS, you could say, has kind of been the only ground truth we have to work with, right? It's the only thing that we can say. Uh, so we have this thing we found. Does it belong to the organization that we're trying to map out? And if we can't get some you know, something with, with DNS to say, yep, it falls within the scope or it, it's, uh, yeah, it belongs to the organization, then we have to let it go because we don't really have a lot of ways to say, wait, you know, we have another reason to believe that it belongs to this organization. But JARM fingerprinting creates a whole nother dimension where now we have another place to ask the question, does this belong to the same organization? Because these fingerprints are so unique to who actually stood the servers up that if we find a JARM fingerprint on 
an asset that we can say we know this belongs to, let's say, you know, OWASP. Uh, we know it's their server because we do have, say, DNS to uh, back that up. But now we could start asking the question: Well, have has anyone seen this germ fingerprint anywhere else? Because if if yes, then let's inc include those assets in the um, in our discoveries or findings. Also, what if it reveals uh, new second level domains? So going back to the idea of the horizontal domain name correlation. So what if we we discover a whole nother domain that we didn't know about because JARM revealed that that was part of this organization's namespace. You know, it just, it just w opened the scope for us. I, I'm just very excited about this. I can't wait to bring JARM into how a mass operates so that we have this other question we can, we can ask that will open the doors for, for uh, new possibilities. There's other ways that people can obviously use this uh, fingerprint, fingerprinting technique, and I would just encourage everyone to start learning about it. It's such an amazing contribution from Salesforce. Uh, we would like to, so right now this is a tool, right? It's a tool like Nmap. You, you saw me playing with it. Uh, I use it at the command line. I think it would be powerful if there were um, other ways to deploy this so that it doesn't have to run on one machine. It could run on several machines, but it would be as if you had one execution of the tool, but distributing the, the uh, workload across the different machines. It would also help um, make it, it would make it harder for DN public DNS resolvers to know is all of this coming from one place or or not, right? I mean, it would it would make it easier to stay under the thresholds that cause uh, resolvers to limit traffic. That would be very helpful, <clears throat> but it would also just be helpful for resource management. I mean, some of these enumerations can take a long time, and they can use up a lot of uh, memory. It'd be great if we could spread that out, uh, you know, in a like a cloud environment or something like that. So that that's uh, on the radar. We'd like to you know, continue the investigation of the intelligent name guessing. I think there's some promise there. We just need to uh, do a better job uh, doing our homework on that. Because I think it would, if we wanted more and more uh, names to guess and we had the time to entertain that, uh, that that would be probably our next best place to go to, to get more names. I would like to be able to intelligently profile DNS resolvers. So as I mentioned earlier, for instance, Google's uh, public DNS resolver is amazing. It's you know extremely high performance, but there's a lot of them out there that are not. And you can quickly overwhelm them if you're uh, sending too much traffic to them. But I mean, what if we could really accurately uh, feel out how much each one is willing to accept and we just used them within their limits, right? Uh, I, I think this is quite doable. It just needs the, you know, some attention to be put on this. We're already handling each resolver separately. So from a kind of like a performance perspective, we're already breaking out. Uh, we have, like, I guess you could say separate instantiations of code for each resolver. So. It wouldn't be that hard to say, well, in addition to doing that, let's just start keeping track of you know, how well are they responding. And maybe we should slow down, maybe we can go faster, things like that. And um, as you can imagine, some people just don't want to use a tool that uh, is kind of like Nmap, right? They don't want to be on the command line. Some people have asked if we're thinking about creating web inter web interface to this or like dashboards um, or the ability to run it kind of like a service that they could put somewhere and then just check a web interface. I think these are good ideas. Uh, you know, I understand not everybody wants to run things from the command line. So I'm definitely for the idea of doing this. I just think we need to take our time and do this carefully, but I'm, 
I'm uh, supportive of this effort. And with that, look at that, pretty good timing. Um, questions? Yes, we do have a few of those. Um, the first question I have here is by Nathan, who asks, how does a mass tackle wildcards in subdomain enumeration? That's a great question. <clears throat> and um, it does. It's a harder problem, I think, than some people realize. Perhaps Nathan understands. But so it's a mixture of we first ch check where did we get this name from? Is it a trustworthy source or a sor or is it something like brute forcing where it was just made up? And if we if we don't have any evidence that this was a name that came from the target organization itself, therefore we have a good reason to believe that it's legitimate, then we make sure to do the <clears throat> DNS wildcard detection where we so the typical process for that, right, is where you, you generate false names and you check how uh, the DNS resolvers respond to those names. If they're giving you what seem like valid answers to what you know are bad names, then you can be pretty sure that it's because they have a wild card there or they could just be a bad resolver. But either way, we mark uh, that portion of the namespace as we can't trust when we get an answer that it's actually a legitimate answer. So if in the future, if we uh, resolve names and they match what the wildcard gave us, then we don't accept it. <clears throat> but there, you have to be careful how you use this. It's, it's a little sensitive. Uh, if you want to join our Discord server, I would say, come to me uh, sometime on the Discord server and I could explain or show you the code where this actually takes place and you could get a more detailed answer. Okay. Um, one question I had was you were being very specific about the order of the parameters. Is that actually important to the tool? Because you made a point of ending with uh, minus D domain name. No, good question. <clears throat> it doesn't matter at all. The, the flags can be put in any order you like. Okay. Then we have one more, which is, um, what is the advantage of using a graph database for a mass aside from easily creating graphs? Fair question. <clears throat> and so actually I had a slide on this, <laughs> um, for this, and I considered keeping it in for this presentation. I'm glad I didn't given the, the time this took, but a lot of people ask this question. It's a great question. Um, I guess the simplest answer I could come up with is the internet and its infrastructure, internet infrastructure is not a list. It's a graph. <clears throat> and there, there are a lot of relationships that we're keeping track of both in the infrastructure and the, what I would, what I kind of call security relationships that, are easier to represent as a graph than it is as tables. Not that it's impossible. Not, I'm not sure there's anything that's impossible to represent as a relational database that you can create in a graph database, but it's definitely a lot easier to work with it as a graph, both conceptually and to a degree uh, computationally. Okay. Um, I was also wondering, you've mentioned that you rely a lot on DNA, DNS. Have you considered uh, potentially using DOH or DOT? So it's still DNS, but then over HTTPS or using the DNS over TLS. Does that, is that, does mm. that play uh, a role? We used to. So, um, previous, so this is a long time ago. I think it's bef before this was a OWASP project we played around with using uh, DNS over HTTPS and it was fun. Uh, it works, but it definitely was not as fast. Uh, I've heard though that there's been improvements on that front. So I, you know, I don't have specs right here to say why we have to do it one way or the other. Um, 
the other the other reason is there's some interesting things you can do with um so a mass by default tries to get the dns resolver to hide your location to the authoritative name server now there's no guarantee the resolver will do this so if you want to make sure it's actually happening you have to go find out the policy of the organization that's uh, making the resolver available. But for instance, uh, Google claims they honor this. So by doing that, it makes it so that by the time the target organization sees the DNS request, it should not give them the information necessary to know where did this come from. Um, not that you necessarily are losing that with DNS over HTTPS. Maybe I'm just paranoid, but since HTTPS uh, sends so much more information. I guess it just makes me think, why send more? Let's continue sending as little as possible. <clears throat> that and the performance, you know, possible performance issues just makes me think, let's just stick to the way we're doing it. But if anyone wants to present to me why I should reconsider, please, uh, please do. Or come, like I said, come to our D uh, Discord server, and I'd be, I'd love to talk about it. Okay, I got one more question from Nathan B, who already said he will definitely join the Discord. Um, he was asking, how do you determine if a certain domain belongs to a target organization? Right, so these are good questions. I can't wait to meet Nathan. Um, <laughs> so put simply, you would think initially you would say, well, you can't, right? Um, unless they tell you what it is, but there are things you can do with who is, assuming of course they're not using completely private who is records, which of course uh, makes this even harder, but there's things you can do with who is and reverse who is um, that allow you to take common data from one who is record to another <clears throat> and search for it, right? And find more domain names that I guess you could say hopefully belong to the same organization because they were registered in a similar way, um, things like that. There's, there's also, try to think of all of this, this data that we're collecting as having the potential to be like leaking hints that this could belong to something else as well or be asso associated. The, the big change coming up in 2021 for the Amass project that's going to make what make this even easier, your question. Uh, how do we find more domains that belong to the same organization is that JARM technique. I, I can't wait to see what happens when we uh, completely implement this and it starts showing us new namespaces, new uh, subnets and things like that, that are clearly part of the same organization based on th the setup and maintenance um, configuration and things like that of these uh, web servers and they reveal n new assets to us. It's going to be quite exciting, I think, but good question. I mean, it's a hard problem. If you're working with a client, you know, I, I would just say, ask them, right? It's easier that way and <laughs> just get them to show you all the names they've registered because it's easier to just start with that knowledge up front. Okay, we got one. Uh, oh, actually, it's already two questions. So uh, he said, uh, I've got a question from Dirk W who said, you said something like using TLS is noisy. Could you go into more detail? But he then clarifies that was very early and probably you didn't mean TLS for enumeration, not DOT, DOH. Hmm. I'm struggling so what, to... What did, what did you say I said was noisy? The use of TLS... I think it's in the context of it would be noisy towards the DNS resolver so that they can identify you and potentially block you. Yeah, if, if I did say TLS, I, I might have just made a mistake, but maybe what you or maybe what was being discussed was the fact that the TLS fingerprinting is active, similar to uh, like actively going and pulling TLS certificates. So. It, it reveals your position because you have to make a direct TCP connection to the target. By default, um, 
a mass does not make any direct connections <clears throat> from your system where this is being run to the target to any of the target's assets only to uh, DNS resolvers and they're and they're not authoritative name servers they are public resolvers if you turn on active mode then there's no no guarantees like now it will attempt to do zone transfers <laughs> you know it's gonna uh, like I said pull data directly from the assets discovered like TLS certificates um, so if you know that's that's a great thing to do for more information if there's no problem with them noticing that you're doing this. I mean, most companies, interestingly, still don't notice, <laughs> which is like, oh, wow, okay. Um, but they don't, a lot of them. So I would kind of encourage someone to just do it anyway, because uh, there's nothing illegal about any of this. I don't know if that answers um, the person's question or not. Uh, I'm going to say hopefully it does. Um, there is a bit of delay between what we say and what YouTube can hear. Um, but it was the last question. So, um, Jeff, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so if people... Yeah, thank uh, you for the opportunity. If people want to look and learn more about Amas, it's uh, it's an OS flagship project. You should be very... Uh, everybody should be easily capable of finding that. Um, Google is your friend, should you need to? And ah, the question asker uh, answered that, yep, that was indeed the answer to his question. So he's happy. Um, if I could just do a little plug real quick on... Sure, sure, sure. Um, please feel free to uh, obviously come to the repo, read about, for instance, how we hand, you know, our interest in contributors, uh, how we communicate with people, like I kept saying, you know, pretty repeatedly, uh, come to the Discord server, and we are a very welcoming uh, project. <laughs> so if you find this interesting at all uh, and you want to contribute in any way, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, we bring you know we bring in contributors regularly, and we've had some pretty amazing contributions. Or even if you just want to, of course, uh, fire us a PR or something like that. But uh, please come in... Um, join the party so to speak uh, i've had some people tell me that they didn't realize that like it was that easy or that they didn't have to say i don't know get invited so yeah there's no need for invitations um invite yourself and um we can discuss all the details in the discord server okay. thank you for your time thank you for listening and uh we look forward to either Hearing about uh, your success uh, uh, with a mass, either you know tw on Twitter or Discord, uh, bring all bring all the goods and bads to us. I'll, I'll end it there. We, we want to know everything. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Right, thank you.